we go from the heavy guitar riff to like the most subdued sort of like chill sort of mu music coming into Real Like Politics. Hope everybody's having themselves a great May 20th Friday here as we head into the Canadian long weekend. Lots to discuss on the Canadian political front for sure, although we're going to stretch it a little bit into the more of a global perspective and bring that home here to Canadian ag policy as well. Joining me is Kelvin Hepner. Hey, Kelvin, how are you? Doing well, Sean. It's raining outside, so we're not seating yet, but uh, love to talk politics. And I guess, yeah, today we're focusing kind of on some more global international political issues. Yeah, lots happening. You know, whether it's dairy trade, we got stuff happening in, in the wheat market uh, as well. Big decisions by countries on what they're going to do with exports of food production, maybe keep more, try to keep more of it at home. What are some of the impacts of that? Uh, lots to discuss here. Have you seeded, a draw have you seeded anything yet? Some of the neighbors have. There is one field on our section that's seeded, but none of our acres are yet, no. Yeah, I just talked to a farmer from Yorkton that said he is on his 15,000-acre grain farm, he has not seeded a single acre yet. So uh, that is that is concerning for, for sure. Hey, let's bring in this week's guest. Uh, he is the research director at CAPI. Always love chatting with him. It is Al Muscle. Hey, Al, how are you? Very well. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's great to chat with you. There's Al, there's just so much to chat about here. We, uh, we're trying to figure out, okay, where should we start? Because in some ways, there's different topics, but in a way, they're all sort of kind of intertwined on what's happening mm -hmm. here right now. Um, right before we came on the air, I, I saw a headline from The Telegraph, and it says... Mounds of grain left to rot as Putin blackmails the world. There is so much focus right now on food security or maybe insecurity from country to country. There is a lot of focus right now on wheat. Uh, India limiting uh, to some extent their wheat exports. They're the second largest exporter of wheat in the world. Al, when you look at how countries are all of a sudden really, really hyper-focused on this uh, issue of, of food scarcity and and wheat, and it's so much tied to wheat because of bread, uh, how, how do you break it down? Well, it's, it's simply a troubling situation. Um, you know, we've got quite a number of countries um, in the developing world, especially North Africa, East Africa, Middle East, that where people get a high proportion of their calories from from bread products, whether it's, you know, whether it's, you know, noodles or, or uh, sorry, wheat products, uh, bread, noodles, um, et cetera. Thus the, the focus on wheat and, and really um, it's unclear to what extent they're going to substitute to other products. So something about two weeks ago from the USDA out of Tunisia. And basically what it said is, is that, uh, you know, in the face of rising, prices for wheat products people aren't going to cut back so i don't know i don't know where that takes us um <laughs> some people are you know we, we got serious worries about hunger and and uh, potentially starvation coming associated with that yeah i, I should mention I, or I should have mentioned actually at the top of the show here that if you do have a question or comment and want to participate in this program we are live on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, I think LinkedIn too. So if you do have a question or comment, please enter it in the box wherever you're watching. But uh, before I get to any of your questions, I'll let Kelvin Hepner uh, go next. Are we, so Al, on, on this topic of wheat, uh, Sean brought it up earlier today. The Economist has uh, a cover right now talking about the, the shortage of wheat globally with a, a picture of uh, three wheat heads on it. Are we at the peak right now in terms of uh, this getting so much mainstream attention? Uh, yeah, good, good question, Kelvin. Um, my guess is, um, is I mean, there, there's, there's so many moving parts. This is, this is a difficult question to answer. Um, the wheat crop in Ukraine is overwhelmingly winter wheat. The Chinese wheat crop is also overwhelmingly winter wheat. Uh, what will happen with the Ukrainian uh, winter wheat crop is anybody's guess. You know, that's 
probably I, I'm, I'm guessing they would start harvesting in it could be as early as late June, uh, if, if, if not certainly July. Uh, what the status of conflict, particularly in eastern Ukraine, will be by then is who knows. Um, you know, Sean mentioned uh, uh, rotting inventories of wheat. You know, there's been a lot of reporting now of thefts of grain, I assume corn and wheat primarily, from eastern Ukraine and, and taken away by military vehicles somewhere um uh that that's a problem but more uh, more generally we've got uh, we've got storages at ports that are still filled with last year's corn crop last year's wheat crop and unless there's somewhere for that to go it's unclear what do you what are you going to do with the new crop wheat as it whatever whatever is harvested in ukraine where's it going to go um, apparently, Russian forces in the east of Ukraine have, it almost seems like they've singled out ag infrastructure. So I, I, probably at this point, everybody's seen the, the equipment that's been stolen. Um, that's That's been pretty widely viewed. But uh, but there are also a lot of damage, as I understand, to, to infrastructure, uh, including uh, elevators, etc. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't have a lot of good answers to that question, Kelvin, but but there's just so many dimensions to it. Yeah. So so Al, do you, do you think we're going to see more countries do what India is saying, like you know limiting their exports? So you know Indonesia has been flip flopping on palm oil uh, over the last couple of weeks. Another announcement out this morning on you know just it seems to be a lot of confusion about what your consistency and what they're actually going to do as uh, producers probably have a bit of a different feeling than, than the government does on, on what is good policy. So is this kind of where we're at here right now with so much focus on will we have enough to feed our people? The best thing to do is to limit exports, but there's consequences that come with that kind of situation a- as well. Yeah, oh, oh, for sure there's consequences. It's starting to look a lot like COVID vaccines all over again, right? So it's, you know, countries are taking the position of, we don't know what's going to happen here. So we're going to take maybe an extreme conservative position is we'll make sure we got enough for our own. And, and, you know, if we, if we err by a hundred percent, 200 percent, well, at least we're safe. And of course, when you do that, that makes the, that, that just makes the overall situation worse. Um, I mean, you, you, you understand the motivation, but, uh, you know, as, as uh, WTO Director General has mentioned in, in some recent speeches, you know, th- this is exactly the time that we need the international trade system to be working as seamlessly as possible to try and fill these terrible gaps in supply. And, and this is exactly, you know, it's, we're, we're, we're sort of working on a bit of a perverse um, approach at this point, it's just making it worse. So, Al, if we're going to avoid those scenarios where we have these unintended consequences, or, or as you said, these kind of per- perverse outcomes from these these policies, at least globally, we saw that with the India export ban announcement on the weekend and what that did to global wheat prices. What mechanism is there right now for kind of enforcing uh, free trade and and getting comp- countries on board with uh, with maintaining open markets and open borders and, and kind of what the WTO, I guess, has traditionally done and, and is, of course, urging in this scenario as well. But what is there in terms of a force globally right now that's uh, that's putting pressure on countries like in India or, or a, a different country that's looking at its domestic food security at, at keeping their borders open? Yeah, I, 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 I think the answer to Sorry, that I'm giving is... Sorry, you impossible questions. Well, it, <laughs> Um, it, it's, well, it's, it's an unprecedented situation as far as I know. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when you're, when you're faced with a, a situation of, of conflict as we are now between, between, you know, that, that will tend to cause people to, uh, throw some of the rules out the window. And then of course, the fact that we don't have a functioning appeals body, the WTO, uh, though, those two factors right there will tell you, you you're in a bit of a time in which countries are going to be inclined to just fall back on first principles and, you know, what's good for me today. Um, hopefully this doesn't last very long and, and we can get back around to, you know, understanding that, that we, you know, we need each other. Uh, 
uh, free trade works, and it's especially important in, in times of great shortage like we're in today. Um, but some some panic, and then and then you know matters of conflict, and and there are parts of uh, the WTO uh, rules that do contemplate conflict, but they've never really been tested under a situation like today. We, we heard earlier this week that Canada is going to assist Al in trying to get some of that, you know, U.S. grain, per, or sorry, Ukrainian grain production out of the country. Um, the U.S. is also talking about trying to figure out how to do that. Uh, we've seen a lot of attention from U.S. Me- ag media outlets on, on that inventory that is kind of stuck there, uh, essentially, as the Telegraph said, being held ransom. Um, is does is that going to make that big of a difference? Do you think like and and does that esc- you know if they do go in and try to get it, uh, however however you define that, does that potentially just escalate this thing even further and and really involve uh, the North American players more in the conflict? Well, I, th- I think we need to put some of the pieces together on that, Sean. So what has been reported, what what, what I have read anyway, I believe is twenty million tons. Um, the idea that um, has been floated is, it's a little bit like, I, I liken it to sort of a, a reverse Berlin airlift. You know, so, so rather than bringing food into um, an, an isolated area, instead we're, gonna, we're going to take food out of the isolated area, and, and you have to have a, a secure shipping lane for that. Um, if, if I understand correctly, I, th- I think the idea would be that um, some of the markets that have historically been served by Ukraine, um, those flagships would be would be provided safe passage to go into the Black Sea um, and and remove these volumes of what I understand are probably mostly corn, but also some wheat. Uh, and, th- and then they would uh, then they take those out of there and, and go back to those countries that historically have been served by Ukraine. Um, I, I haven't read any reaction from the Russians on this. I, I assume that they see this as a bit of leverage for them, so they're probably not particularly enamored of the idea. Uh, what what happens if you set this up and uh, the Russian Navy decides they're going to take target practice on some of these uh, some of these vessels and somebody shoots back? There's 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 a lot of there's a lot of risk in it, but the converse of that risk is like what what is going to happen? You know, we, we have to try and get our minds around just how large the Ukraine is as an agricultural producing country. In fact, if you add the tonnages up of everything, you know, it's it's simplistic, right? But the you know the tons of all the different products, the Ukraine and Canada actually they look a lot like one another in terms of the total tons. Can you imagine Canada just disappearing from the map? Well, if we're going to get anything out of Ukraine, uh, certainly this crop year, and, and you have to assume going forth in the next crop year, and, and who knows how long after that, the grain has to have somewhere, to, the grain and other crops, they have to have somewhere to go. So if you are able to move the volume that's in store there now out of there in, a, in an efficient uh, process, us, then that would, that would give it somewhere to go, and that would sort of kickstart your the ag system in Ukraine. You also mentioned to me, Al, that uh, you're seeing some news of some countries, you know, sort of the opposite, where we have you know countries like India and Indonesia talking about limiting exports, but there's also countries looking at reducing tariffs they've had in place to try to bring more products into the country because they're trying to fight inflationary pressure. Is this something we're going to see more of? Uh, You you have to wonder if perhaps we will. Um, So the ones I've, I'm aware of, and there may be maybe others, but uh, Mexico and Brazil uh, both uh, unilaterally did away with quite, or sorry, lowered quite a range of, um, of tariffs. Uh, the foodstuff products. So, so the clear you know, target of this is uh, is consumers. Um, yeah, you'd, you'd have to think. You know, uh, countries that have you know a high proportion of household incomes that are going into paying for food. I mean, it's it's in their interest to be able to try and cut back on that inflation as much as possible. And and, and this is one way to do it. 
it's it, you know with with in the case of Brazil, it may seem odd because you know they're they're also a major major exporting country. Um, but it, but it's odd. I I think some of the South American countries in particular feel like um, and and whether they regret it, I don't know. But um, I, I assume that they maybe do. You know, they they lined up and committed large volumes of export product to China in particular, and maybe some other uh, destination countries as well. And in consideration of that, took in some investment, but now they have to worry about feeding their own domestic population, you know, despite the fact they're major producers and major exporters. There's a certain irony in that, but but we've lived with this for a few years now. Like, like some of us remember, uh, that would be 2018 or 2019, I can't remember which, in which, um, I believe the second or third largest importer of U.S. soybeans was Argentina. Well, how on earth did that happen? Well, they sold all their soybeans to the Chinese and their crush plants. We're looking for volume to run through it. Well, where else are they going to get it? Crazy. Would another example be China and Canadian canola, Al, on this? Not a, not a tariff per se, but uh, a non-tariff trade barrier that uh, China has lifted on, on our canola now. Yeah, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I, I didn't have any particular timeline in mind for when this might happen. I guess we shouldn't be totally surprised if, for no other reason, that we've got this, uh, you know, price spike and such tension in the oils market. They're looking for oils, and and uh, we, we, I mean, we have been a, a significant supplier to China, particularly on the on the canola side for crushing in China, and. Um, so in, the, in their wisdom, they despite, decided they'd uh, let us back in. Yeah, for sure. I think that's part of it. Mm-hmm. And whether or not that's tied to the decision that was announced yesterday regarding Huawei, that's uh, that's a whole another uh, conversation, which I'm not sure anybody publicly has answers to right now. I've been, I've been trying to play in my mind here, you know. Would the Chinese have opened access to Canada for canola had they known that Indonesia was going to change its policy on palm oil exports, which, if I understand correctly, is not a it's not a total release of the export ban. Instead, it's something akin to a quota, like you have to satisfy. I think you said Sean, thirty percent has to remain domestic before anything is is exported. So it's a bit of a nuanced thing in that regard. Well, it may, you know, who knows if the if the Chinese had of had have known that maybe they wouldn't have let Canadian canola back in, and if 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 the Canadian canola hadn't have been let back in, I don't know if we would have made the announcement on Huawei. Maybe, yeah. maybe we're you know maybe we're sort of taking that too far and connecting things that are actually disconnected. I'm not I'm not sure, but it's a, it's a remarkable set of events in a very narrow window of time. That's for sure. The the other the other thing I wonder if we're going to see more of, and it's been in place for a while, is like Argentina on soybean exports, where they have they have a tax. Uh, significant tax. I think it's like 25% on all soybean mm-hmm. exports out of the country. There's uh, monetary motivations for for that. Um, but you, you could see, you know, some countries potentially looking at that as a way to try to b- keep more of that production at, at home as well. Yep. Um, if you go to the International Food Policy Research Institute website, they have quite a list of all the different uh, export restrictions. Mo- most of them are export bans. I haven't, um, I haven't counted all of them, but um, just to give you a bit of a bit of a sense here, I do have a partial list that I can make reference to. And, you know, some of the, some of the big items here, um, Argentina on beef, we've, we've talked about Indonesia and palm oil, Kazakhstan on uh, wheat, wheat flour and sunflower seeds. Of course, Russia on on wheat, Turkey on olive oil, all cooking oils, um, Belarus. Uh, th- those are export lists. There, there's yeah, I, I, won't, I won't get into all the detail of it, but there's a very very long list now in play, and all effective that are dealing with export restrictions. I, th- I think it's unprecedented. You know, the the other one that was was uh, interesting. Um, the the former Russian president, and he's the he's the vice president now, or something like that. Maybe maybe I think they have a prime minister as well. Uh, Medvedev is is his name. Yep. You know, he said something a few weeks ago that I thought was a little bit chilling. He said something like, 
well, you know, Russia is a major wheat exporter, but maybe we'll only uh, export wheat to friendly countries. So that, that really sounds like they're quite prepared to use food as a weapon. And I guess we shouldn't be surprised, but. So who are their so friends at this they're... point, though, Al? They basically, does that make them beholden to China? Like who, who then, what are they doing? Uh, no, come on, Sean, they got lots of pals. Uh, North Korea, Syria, Iran. <laughs> All the, all the friendly types in the world. Yeah, they're, they're ready. Um, the, the, all the people you yeah, want to barbecue I mean, with they, on the weekends. <laughs> sure. Um, uh, yeah, the, you know, at, at the, prior to the invasion, uh, at, the, at the time of the Winter Olympics, uh, Russia and China announced this uh, arrangement on, on wheat. Uh, previously, there's a, there's a disease issue that China had raised concerns with China, uh, with, with Russia over previously, uh, such that they would only take wheat imports from certain regions in Russia. I don't, I'm not sure what the disease is, pest issue. Um, but at any rate, they, <laughs> yeah. they, uh, where have I heard this before? Yeah. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Anyway, uh, uh, now that, but that's not an issue now. They'll take it from anywhere. And, and, you know, Canada, you know, it's easy to sit here and be hypercritical of some of the the policies that other countries are trying to put in place to try to benefit themselves and some of the impacts that it has on the world. But here at home, where we have a situation where Eastern Canadian farmers have been significantly impacted by f- sanctions on fertilizer coming from Russia and Belarus. And in some cases, that fertilizer was ordered and paid for last fall, long before the conflict, being delivered post-Russian invasion of Ukraine and still having to pay a sanction. And uh, so we, we have our own sort of, uh, I guess, things to explain on, on some of these fronts. Al, what's your, what's your opinion of uh, what the Canadian government's been doing in terms of sanctioning fertilizer coming out of that region, when other countries, it doesn't sound like they're doing the same. Yeah, it it, it, it seems like there's some other countries that have um, you know, essentially not complied with with that uh, that element of, of trying to uh, close in uh, close in the Russians, um, you know, as part of the sanction uh, efforts. Yeah, the you know the the, the dilemma is uh, for many years now, uh, Eastern Canada, particularly on would be urea, and to some extent UAN as well. But but particularly, I mean, we we, have, we clearly we have, we have no issues on on potash, but it, it would be urea and UAN, and and that's been the major presence in this um, uh, in Eastern Canada. It. it I think we're coming to the quick realization now that, you know, just as energy drives geopolitics, fertilizer drives geopolitics. And, you know, if, if you want to, like, so Eastern Canada needs to have some concerns about that. But if you want to know who's really worried, it's Brazil, it's India, Brazil in particular, my, my understanding, they have almost no uh, domestic fertilizer. Uh, you know, they're, they're depending on, Others for potash, or depending on others for nitrogen, especially Russia, uh, and like most of the rest of the world, they're depending on others for phosphates. So, um, some weeks ago, there was a letter written by five South American ministers of agriculture, led by the minister of agriculture in Brazil, requesting that there be an exemption on you know the, the overall sanctions against Russia that they exempt. Um, fertilizers from Russia and Belarus. In my understanding, officially, it didn't get a whole lot of traction, but apparently there are ways around this. And I mean, I, I, I understand their desperation, but I think for us, it, it sort of says, well, now, you know, hang on here a minute. We need to rethink, you know, maybe the low cost provider into Eastern Canada was Black Sea origin urea in particular. But what would it take, you know, I mean, we, Canada's a net exporter of urea, but it's all out of the West. What would it take to have Canadian urea in Eastern Canada as the as the dominant commercial source? Because we have to worry about this now. And it and and it's not just this year. Clearly, we're gonna have to worry about what we're gonna do next year 
and the year after that, et cetera. And, and you know, if, if you were going to do something along the um, the nitrogen manufacturing side in Eastern Canada, I don't know how long that takes to develop. I'm sure you're not going to do it overnight. And there's probably a lot of people that don't want it in their backyard, et cetera. So what are we going to do about this? I, I think it's a very important issue. Okay, so Kelvin, I'm going to ask you. You know, we 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 didn't have the political will on Energy East. You know, Al brings up a good point about getting fertilizer that's produced in Western Canada into Eastern Canada, so they don't have to rely on the Black Sea region. Do we have the political will to do something like that, or is that just too big a thinking for for this time period? It's a good question. I I, I wonder whether it's uh, while well, the market to some extent could drive it, whether the railways. Uh, work this into their logistical planning. I, I'm not sure how, like, how do we see this fertilizer moving from Western Canada into into Ontario and, and Quebec? Would this mainly be by rail via the U.S. maybe? I'm not sure what, uh, Al, do you have any thoughts there on, on how we would transport it across the Canadian Shield? Besides a catapult, that's not going to work. We need something <laughs> else. Yeah, yeah. Well, in, in the immediate term, presumably it's rail. I don't know what other yeah. options are. Um, when you get into urea, I and and again, I'm I'm going to get outside my expertise here. Uh, when you get into urea, like trucking it long distances and moving it around, I worry like everybody knows at some point it'll start to cake on you, right? And I I don't I don't know how we handle all that. I assume you don't want a whole lot of handling around bulk urea. So some you know as, as far as what you can do with with rail of of the finished product, good question. Uh, you know, if, if you had an east-west uh, natural gas pipeline, that'd be something you could tap into to, ma to make urea. Then so you run into the NIMBY, the NIMBY problem, though, with the, the infrastructure required at the other end of the pipeline. No, and well, you, you, you do. And, and, and yeah, I, I raised the point. But, you know, at the same time, I think as Canadians, we have to come to some realization that, look, our world is changing pretty rapidly and pretty dramatically here. And some of the NIMBY stuff, I, I, I think we're just going to have to let go on that because, you know, if we want to continue to have our, our standard of living, we would like to retain or, or increase our place in the world. So we're, we're going to, need to have to take on some of these issues. And, and I think that aspect of energy, uh, move, moving, moving energy uh, to make it available throughout the country, I think is an important part of that. But but, the, but is there the political will to do that? So Al, you know that makes sense. You can justify that in your mind. But is there po the political will to for the current government to do so? To you know to to say, hey everybody, we've been telling you about this. You know the, all these concerns for so long. We you know based on hey, things have changed. We need to park it, and we need to do this for these reasons. Do do we have the political will to do that? Well, I, I, you know, I, I think the challenge is that, that we've um, embarked pretty ambitiously on, on the greenhouse gas mitigation, you know, uh, anti-fossil fuel uh, side. And, and there's there's reasons that we did that. I think we now need to be able to say, well, like, look, you know, that that wasn't wrong, but we need to be able to, to um, uh, expand that somewhat and sort of say, well, OK, you know what? Um, fossil fuels are, are not are not great from a climate change perspective, but uh, you know maybe rather than just this idea you can just up and do away with things or, or dramatically reduce, what we need to do is look at incremental improvements. So uh, you know, uh, natural gas is a cleaner fuel than coal, for example, or or other or other fuels. Um, so so maybe we go that route. And by the way that helps us in our objective of you know ultimately needing to feed people or support allies or or address uh issues of of conflict that are now upon us we can't ignore this nor should we so this morning al i, I haven't seen any reporting on it yet but i saw uh, the european commission tweeted that uh, it's proposing a 1.4 billion euro lump sum payment to european farmers to help them offset high input costs. Uh, here in Canada, of course, farm groups have been lobbying for uh, these something to be done about these sanctions on, on fertilizer. Is this a policy that uh, could cross the ocean and we could have our government 
I, I'm, I'm not sure. We had, we talked to Minister Bibo on on the weekend on Saturday about the fertilizer sanctions in a press conference, and she said they are still looking at options. She wouldn't say any further detail on how to handle this fertilizer sanction issue. Uh, do you think our government would consider payments to offset the uh, the sanction price on fertilizer in Ontario and, in Quebec, and Quebec? Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to speculate what they might do. Um, I, I think, you know, when, and I, I, I hope I'm right about this, but, you know, as, as our uh, input costs have gone up dramatically, of course, our on the on the on the field crop side at least, our uh, the values of our products have gone up um, uh, remarkably as well, right? So I think there's a bit of a sense that we, you know, there's there's um, well, you know, to to take a look at fertilizer, you know, the the, the StatsCan uh, outlook that came out about a week or so ago was talking about uh, a sharply higher acreage of wheat. And also a sharply higher acreage of corn. Well, those are two pretty significant nitrogen using crops. So it's not indicative of, you know, this idea that that farmers are being scared away from um, uh, nitrogen using crops due to the expense of fertilizer. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, you know, some of your viewers are going to agree with me when you go to pace on these fertilizer bills. It's just, you know, absolutely astounding. And you have to cash flow that, but you're getting pretty good price for your crops too. So I, when when the margin comes out, I'm not sure it's going to be. You know, early on we worried this could be a train wreck. I, I don't think it's going to be a train wreck. So I, I think we probably want to hold off or um, let's 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 see how this plays out. We we could end up okay out of this. Yeah, and and to me those types of payments to cover inflation that doesn't it just create all kinds of other unintended consequences that well yeah, like more <laughs> exactly yeah well look, yeah, look at uh, the pandemic and inflation yeah, but, uh, the, the, those covid just, dollars are a big part of the reason why we're in this spot right now in the first place yeah yeah no no, no doubt a factor sean i wouldn't want to speculate how much um but uh yeah sorry there was something you mentioned kelvin and i i just lost my uh, my train of oh i know what it was um, the, the one thing that I think is an issue, and, you know, I, I hope everybody who, you know, had an interest in participating did take advantage of the advanced payments program. One thing about these input costs, like even if you're, if, if we've got high crop prices to offset it, you still have to cash flow that. And, and frankly, one of the things I find the most disruptive out of the situation that we're in today is probably the financial side rather than the you know, sort of the uh, the cost and return side, it, it's the financing, um, you know, so so you've got a cash flow, you know, and, and, and maybe, you know, October comes and you'll get all your money back and then some. And I expect that's probably what's going to happen. And, and I sure hope that's what happened. But in the intermediate period, you got to finance that and, and you got to deal with all the quirks that will occur between now and harvest. Right. And, and you seem to be seeing this everywhere this this the financial stress that's brought on by this you know so, so the you know the most obvious examples of course are in the uh, hedging um uh futures trading where you know some of the margin calls of uh that elevators and, and producers that hedge themselves must have faced a bit just must be exorbitant hard hard to imagine uh i've had anecdotal discussions with some some producers some you know family businesses that run elevators and it's just astounding how much cash they've chewed through trying to hold on and, and keep these hedge positions on. So that that's one example. The, the other one is, you know, when you, when you, uh, as, you know, Kelvin, you mentioned a moment ago, like when you're into a cycle of inflation, everybody wants to buy as much as they can right now before it gets even more expensive. Well, that of course, you know, it's again, another perverse thing that by itself makes the problem worse, but the, the cash that it sucks up that has to come from somewhere, or is not available to do other things with, I think that's really going to start to stress people. And, and you know, that and then all the volatility that naturally comes with very high prices. To me, that's a real worry for um, for our industries. I've got a comment here from Jim, farms in the Palliser Triangle portion of Saskatchewan. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, Jim says the price is up now, but will it still be up in the fall? Talking about commodity prices with the drought in my area. I can't see, I can't do much forward pricing and most of those crops can't be hedged with an option. I don't see this as much of an issue for this crop here, but next crop here is everyone will be paying increased input prices. So appreciate your response, Jim, and and sharing some of your personal experiences, but it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I think sort of what Jim alludes to there. I, I think the decisions that farmers have to make going forward on the 23 crop are incredibly difficult. Um, it's, it's a real, you know, you know, on the 22 crop, if you bought fertilizer early, Hey, you, you, you made a good decision. The question is, does that same buying month that you bought last year, is that still, is that the right decision for 23? I, I, I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. Um, it's just, it, it's not predictable. It's so, it's so volatile. And, uh, this has put, uh, I think a lot of farmers in a big point of stress as they start to think ahead about 23 already without 22, even minute. Kelvin hasn't seeded an acre yet. So he's still thinking about 22. Um, but 23, I'm sure is on the back of his mind. Well, no. And, and, and I think Jim raised a very good point. I appreciate your candor, Jim. Um, th- this has a very long shadow to it. Um, and, you know, we, we will be looking at things like crop insurance coverage and, uh, you know, how that carries on year over year and, and the worry that either due to the situation last year uh, and or some people, hopefully not many people, cutting back on inputs and, and having lower yields this year. And, and for gosh sakes, I hope we get a good crop this year everywhere. Yeah. Um, uh, same thing with agri stability. You know, agri stability. Um, has a you know it contemplates a certain cycle but boy you have you have two consecutive bad years and all of a sudden you're you're starting down the road of reduced coverage and and that could be a problem so so all this comes into play and and um yeah it's 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 certainly a multiple a multi-year concern we're into well, wh- why don't we transition to one of the biggest political hot button issues that we have in Canada, at least f- that has a bit of an agricultural tinge to it, and that is dairy policy. And uh, both New Zealand and the U.S. pressing hard on Canada's uh, interpretation and application of dairy, t- a dairy tariff rate quotas. That's a handful. And uh, let's talk about the U.S. because uh, we see the USTR, Catherine Tai, not satisfied. Neither is USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack on how Canada is uh, is doing this. We've had the dispute resolution panel's, uh, I guess, commentary. Al, could we see could we see the U.S. apply retaliatory tariffs on Canada if if Canada doesn't change the way it's doing this implementation? Yeah, so this is our first experience with the dispute resolution mechanism under the the CUSMA agreement, um, and and I'm not sure exactly um, how that works in in terms of what um, options it, it offers parties to in, in terms of retaliation. I get, we may get to find out, but you know that's that that that's with them to uh, that's with them to consider. Um, my read of the panel's decision that went back to, I believe it was January, was um, it, it ruled against Canada, but it was the most narrow technical legal case you could possibly imagine. Like there was three pages that dealt with what the definition of the term allocation means. And and it was referencing this, uh, I think it's something called the the Vienna Convention on Treaties or something that defines what words in a contract mean. And it's like, oh, my gosh, you know, anybody but a lawyer would put the sleep type thing. Right. And OK, so we so we lost on that one. Um, so now it, it but it, but the other thing that's curious. And so the panel was clear that they believe that Canada's uh, legal. Um, um, uh, approach to allocation of TRQ was not consistent with with CUSMA, but it, it also went to some great pains at the end of it. It was kind of weird to sort of say, but, but you know, Canada, the, the, the Minister of International Trade has discretion and, you know, Canada can 
set their, they're they, they free to set their own TRQ policy. It was, it was almost sort of apologetic at the end. Yeah, yeah, Canada, the, 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 if I remember right, the panel favored, went with Canada on three of the four, but the one of the four that the U.S., they sided with the U.S. side, that's the one the U.S. dairy group's been focused on so much. So both sides kind of claim victory, and the rest of us are left to sort of interpret what exactly is going on here, who's right, who's wrong, and we're kind of into this slow playing mode now, it sort of seems like, from my opinion. Yeah, so... It, my view, Sean, is it's a it's a highly technical dispute. Um, you know what what we what we what we've done. So so we 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 had these pools that allocated the quote the the uh, quotas that allow people to apply for import permits, and it was scored eighty five percent for the processors, and then smaller much smaller shares for uh, for distributors. Well, now what they proposed is, well, we'll just take the, the total uh, tons or kilograms we're imported and we'll allocate it on a market share basis. So if, you know, if, uh, if last year, Sean, if, if you brought in half of a particular dairy product that we've got a quota defined for, well, then you've got 50% market share and, and you can apply for permits up to that level. And then, you know, everybody else, they've, they've, they've each got their share. How much how much different that will actually make it, I'm not sure. But I think there's a couple points there. Um, when the CUSMA agreement was being negotiated, the U.S. knew that we used that mechanism to allocate the TRQs. And they never said a thing about it. They didn't object to it. Um, and they knew that that had been agreed to in the CP, that the same mechanism was being used under CP. TPP. Now, I'll come back to New Zealand in, in a moment here, but so, I mean, it's a little bit odd that, that this was not raised as a point of negotiation. During, for all we know, during the negotiations, maybe it was, but it never came into the text anyway. So then they, you know, then there's this, this sort of shock that, oh my gosh, look at how the Canadians allocate these. Well, they knew. They knew all. If they didn't know, they should have known. There's some suspicion that, that the Ultimately, the U.S. dairy industry was not satisfied with what they got from from the CUSMA agreement and that they have in some way wanted to sort of renegotiate this through the courts. And, you know, look, it's in their interest to do that. They, they, they want to be able to export. They need to export. Uh, our market is next door. It's a, you know, it's a wealthy country market. Of course they want to do that. That's, that's not all that surprising. New, New Zealand is a, a bit of an interesting one. I, I guess on, on one hand, um, you know, another country with that has a trade agreement with Canada that has an exporting interest. So if if the U.S. brought this dispute, why wouldn't New Zealand? It's again, it's in their it's in their interest. One of the things I thought was was remarkable was the New Zealand Minister of Trade said, "Well, this is you know he, he was bemoaning the low fill rates on the quotas. In, in other words, the the exports that had been that were uh, the the export access that was allowed under CPTPP, and the the amount the volume that was actually filled relative to what could have been filled. In other words, he was concerned that it was very low. Well, recall that um, this the, those access levels were were negotiated under the TPP before the U.S. left, and when the U.S. left, they didn't change the export the access levels. So they were set assuming that the U.S. was going to be in. So, for example, there's a very large TRQ for bulk milk. Well, and it hasn't been filled at all. Well, should, should we really be all that surprised? I mean, you're not going to ship bulk milk from New Zealand to Canada. That does, I mean, that's just, I'm not sure if it's technically possible. It's not going to be economically feasible. I think you can be pretty confident in that. Um, so I, I, I think that's, that's an important aspect of it. like a, a number of the things that they seem to be concerned about that they didn't get any, didn't get a very high fill rate are highly perishable products. Now on some of the others, like on butter, you know, uh, in, in the, in the WTO global uh, uh, quotas, that quota is designated to New Zealand and in the CPT, CPTPP butter quota, it was very heavily filled. It was more than 90% filled. 
And then, of course, finally, we have to factor in, we did have a, you know, a, a pandemic here the last year, so that sort of bogged down our logistics system. So what might have been exported from New Zealand to Canada uh, was hampered in doing so just because of the general logistics problems that we had. I thought it was interesting, going back to the, the U.S. challenge, this week we saw uh, Global Affairs or, or Minister Ng's department issue a, a statement, and it explicitly mentioned uh, the U.S. electric vehicle uh, tax policy. We don't often see countries explicitly link two different trade irritants like that, or at least it, it seemed like a, a noteworthy uh, mention, or, or, or does that stand out to you, Al? Yes, it stood out to me. I, I, I took note of it. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm speculating here that this was the government sort of trying to emphasize how important the U.S. vehicle subsidy is to them. And, and, and it is very it is very important. But, yeah, it struck me as unusual. Yeah, There's so much intertwined. It's, you know, try, try getting Canada, sugar. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Kevin. I was just going to say it's, it's a card that Canada is trying to play obviously, and, and just the fact that they're mixing files isn't something that we always see, at least. Yeah, I think it's a... My yeah. and, that, and that's one they've, they've been concerned about mentioning for a while. And I, I know in some of my presentations, I've got a list of the trade irritants between the two countries, and that, that's one of the ones that is uh, definitely on there, is the Canadians are making a big deal about it, because there's also incentives in there uh, that have been talked about for uh, those, e not just the use of EV vehicles, but the fact they're made in the U.S., as as well so yeah well and, and you know all, all this chips away at our rules-based trade system and uh i don't know if either of you noticed but to be about two weeks ago now in the national post um uh, tiff macklem uh was was quoted as as saying you know basically there's a growing number of countries in the world that are not interested in rules-based trade and we're not going to be able to do business with those people and, you know, in the past, you know, they, that, that was a handful of countries like, you know, North Korea, Syria, Iran, you know, you could, you could carry on pretty well with, and just ignore them, you know, but, but, you know, when we, when we have some of our uh, historical trading partners that are invoking some of these things and, and, you know, where we have strong relationships and trade flows, we have to worry about that. And, and I thought he enunciated that very well. It's sort of the reverse of, you know, when I asked you, well, who the heck is Russia going to do business with on friendly countries? Who the heck are we going to do business with if we're only going to do business with countries that believe in rules-based trade? Not, and not just say it, but actually follow through on it. Who, who's on that list at this point? <laughs> um, you know, I, I guess I should preface it this way. You know, the, the, the idea of, uh, of, you know, total purity around free trade concepts that, that's always been a little bit of an illusion these are shades of, of gray and and I you know I remember a number of years ago being on this panel at uh, the Canadian Cattlemen Association uh, meeting up in Calgary and and there there's a position that New Zealand has which is something like a trade envoy and and the person's always a farmer and it and it's and they're an ag trade envoy and and we were both speaking the topic was milk supply management and and you know I asked him about pork and, and uh, you know, he, he, he dismissed it. And, and later he, he said to me, he said, you know, I, I wish you hadn't asked me about pork. He said, you know, it's a little embarrassing for us and because it's extremely difficult to export pork to New Zealand. And, and there's a long story, probably a way overreach issue around animal health and food safety that causes them to be difficult on pork. But there's a similar type of thing that Australia has with uh, poultry and eggs. You know, the U.S., it's sugar or it's country of origin labeling, which may be coming back. Everybody's got their thing. So we have to keep that in the back of our mind. So there's, you know, at, at some level, there's some tolerance for it. There's going to be certain parts of the ag trade file that are going to be difficult that you're always going to manage. But you're looking for, you know, counterparts to work with that, you know, for the most part, you know what to expect from them. And, and you know, it's transparent and fair and so on. And, and it's a shrinking number, and, and, and part of that is just driven by the market conditions that we're in today where, you know, we've, we've left this world of um, abundance, apparently, hopefully not permanently, but for now at least, 
and we moved into a world of scarcity and, it, and everybody is concerned about having enough for their own and they're prepared to uh, you know backslide on their commitment to uh, rules-based trade even though we all know collectively it's to our benefit Al, this has been a, a great discussion. Really appreciate you hanging out here for the hour with us. Uh, great stuff. Um, great work at CAPI as uh, you fulfill the research director duties there. Uh, great team over there. We really appreciate uh, you coming on here today on Real Like Politics. Well, thanks very much for the invitation, guys. Kelvin, have yourself a great weekend. Thank you, everyone else as well, and thank you, Al.